This is planned as a series of 12 lectures running over the course of a year, one lecture every month, um, which, uh, which focuses, each lecture focuses on a early 20th century figure, important figure, but forgotten, mostly either forgotten or, um, well, over visible to the point of being under analyzed. So there are figures that we associate with that part of Kerala history, usually referred to as Navodhanam. They are either invisible, uh, like uh, the uh, figure that will be introduced today to us by uh, Dr. Thomas, or they are over visible to the point of being under analyzed. So today we actually have an un, uh, uh, a figure in Malayalam uh, in, the, in the history of Kerala whose who's relevance to the history of Kerala uh, is considerable. You know his contribution to thought in Kerala, economic thought in Kerala, was considerable, but was never really seriously considered or discussed in the Malayali public. So I welcome uh, Dr. E. M. Thomas uh, to to present this talk. Uh, on a very valuable figure, uh, Dr. P.J. Thomas. Uh, Dr. E.M. Thomas has written a couple of very important and useful books on Dr. P.J. Thomas. And as a, uh, in, I remember in my early career when I was working on the um, on family planning, on the generation of public consent for family planning, I came across Dr. P.J. Thomas's writings in Malayalam, and I really wondered why he had not gained uh, the visibility that he should have in our history of the Renaissance, Malayali Renaissance. So doctor, let me just introduce uh, Dr. E.M. Thomas and then we get into the talk. Uh, Dr. E.M. Thomas uh, is at the John Mathai Center at the University of Calicut. Um, he was pre previously Associate Professor of Economics at Christ College, Kiriyalpura. He is a prolific writer and has around 50 professional publications and around 12 books. And this uh, monograph that he has on the writings of uh, P.J. Thomas uh, is definitely a very, very important contribution um, to uh, uh, you know, our understanding of the work of this pioneering economist. In fact, the title of this book is The Story of P.J. Thomas, an Unsung Economist. And this title is available at the Center for Development Studies Library. So, in case you're interested, uh, you can borrow it from here. Uh, he has um, also worked, um, uh, at, you know, he, has, he has basically studied at the University of Belgrade um, for a specialization course on decentralized planning um, too. Uh, so let me welcome you um, uh, warmly, uh, Dr. Ian Thomas. We are eager to hear you. Uh, our usual practice is to uh, wrap up the talk in 40 to 45 minutes and devote the rest of the time to a discussion. Thank you very much. Then, then okay, ma'am. Um, thank, you, thank you very much. Um, with the permission of um, you all, um, may I start my program? Please do. Yes. Okay. Okay, dear all, I feel greatly honored by the invitation from the Center for Development Studies, Tiruvannandapuram, to deliver the inaugural Asadika Amrita Mahalsav lecture series celebrating the 75th year of India's independence. I appreciate this opportunity for different reasons. First and foremost, it is wonderful to have an opportunity like this to celebrate the memory of Dr. P.J. Thomas, a very famous economist and author of Esther years. The second reason is the nature of this event itself. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, now I firmly believe that the 12 years of my continuous research on the contributions of Dr. P.J. Thomas did not go unnoticed. This is a very highly satisfactory moment for me because I did this work 
without the support of anybody else from any corner only because of my of my academic interest i pursued this work and now i could understand from various corners that my work has got the correct recognition and it was reflected from the words of blessings which i received the day before yesterday while dr c rangarajan was releasing my fourth book on uh, dr pj thomas now uh, dr uh, devika has mentioned to you about uh, one of my very important books on thomas titled the story of pj thomas and emerson economy and while releasing that book at a madras university dr c rangarajan asked me to continue my research and if possible to publish almost all the important research papers of dr pj thomas hence i continued my research till a few months back and thus i could collect 37 published research papers and 10 books written by him and uh, at that function i could understand so many important facts the book release function was a meeting place of almost all the important stalwarts of indian economy who did really continue the research programs from the point where dr p j thomas stopped and they were for example one dr c rangarajan the former governor of reserve bank of india who is still going on this research on the topic banking money and finance the second person was dr y v reddy who is still pursuing his research on banking and fiscal federalism another very important and notable economist is dr amir kumar bakshi who is still uh, going on this research on economic history and another another professor was uh, dr k l krishna who is continuing his research on agricultural economics still another giant uh, the fields of federal finance dr m govindaram she is still going on with the research on federal finance and related matters still another very important fellow from kerala who is continuing the research topics left by um, dr p j thomas was our most uh, respected professor m a umman who is continuing his research on land reforms federal finance and uh, money and banking so uh, the words of blessings shared upon me by all these stalwarts gave great energy for me and it is the greatest reward for me in my life for all for all my, for all my all academic activities now let us see uh, or understand who was pj thomas and what was his family background and what were his education background and what were his professional preoccupations these are all very important aspects in this lecture i would like to introduce to you uh, briefly almost all um, these aspects from dr p j thomas was born on 25th february 1893 at koravalinga kottayam district in a middle class agricultural family then he completed his primary education at koravalinga high school education at mannanam uh, then pre degree like uh, or a intermediate course at the cms college kottayam and obtained his ba honors degree from st joseph's college trichy and his phd from oxford university this is his is a um, educational background then immediately after his arrival in india from oxford university he intended to join Maharajas College, they were in the world, the former, the, the present university college, but somehow it did not materialize. But at the same time, University of Madras welcomed him, welcomed him wholeheartedly, and then he joined the faculty, as a, the faculty, uh, the Department of Economics, the University Department. And uh, there, he worked wholeheartedly in all kinds of development, uh, developmental activities of the island state. and he was the dark, he, uh, he became the darling of the then british governor of sri lanka 
uh, called Hat Clifford. But uh, because of his attraction to India and his, his, love, his love for his mother country was um, beyond explanation. I and mean, many of his relatives told me. And so when he got an opportunity to join the Madras School of uh, Madras University in 1927, he left uh, the island state and he joined the Madras University. And then the rest is history. The Madras University and the Department of, Department of Economics acted as a springboard for his rise in all um, fields of activities. And from there, he rose to the, the most famous levels as an, economic, uh, as an uh, economist, uh, administrator, uh, policymaker, and other. Then uh, all these kinds of achievements, he could start from the Department of Economics of Madras University. And then uh, he was a popular economist in that period of time. So understand his popularity, uh, the prime minister, of Madras province, of Madras pro, um, uh, presidency at that time, appointed uh, Pija Thomas, that is Dr. C. Rangela uh, Gopal Ajari, appointed him as his economic advisor. And then again, uh, Dr. C. Um, Gopal Ajari was very confident in the uh, capacity and uh, in the vision and the ability of P.J. Thomas and he entrusted so many duties on him and almost all the economic policies are framed by uh, the president or the, uh, the prime minister of that uh, Madras presidency on the basis of the advice given by Dr. P.J. Thomas. This is also very important but now um, let us pass on to the other important aspects of uh, the life and contributions of P.J. Thomas. In 1942, Dr. Thomas was appointed as the Chief Economic Advisor to the British Government of India. That is very important. And he was, uh, he got the opportunity um, to join the team representing India to sign the first the inaugural session of UNO at San, San Francisco. Soon, he was also a member of the group which represented India to sign the Bretton Woods Agreement, which gave birth, gave birth to IMF and World Bank. Then, another important, uh, important event is that one of the journalists who covered the convention, or that is the uh, inaugural session of the UNO, later rose to become the president of USA. He was none other than John F. Kennedy, and uh, Dr. Thomas was a close friend of Kennedy till his death. And then, when India became independent, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru also appointed Thomas as his first chief economic advisor. It is, uh, it all became possible uh, because of uh, Thomas's academic brilliance, sincerity, dedication, and capacity to conduct serious research works. He also uh, was fortunate enough to, uh, to hold different other positions as well. They are, first of all, um, he was appointed as the member of Legislative uh, Council of Madras State uh, during the 1936-46 period. Then again, he was the president of Indian Economic Association in the period of 1937. He was the chairman of fact-finding committee of a cotton mills in India in 1942. He was the chairman of cotton industry, uh, cottage industries committee in 1950-51. He was the member of prohibition committee appointed by the union government in 1955. And he was the member of a Travancore Kochi Banking Enquiry Committee in 1956. And finally, he was a member of Rajya Sabha from Kerala from the year 1957 onwards. And now let us see what are his major contributions to the discipline of economics. His monumental contributions span over a wide range of economic issues, including development economics, agricultural economics, public finance, international economics, money and banking, national and planning, and local development issues. 
the 10 books and the 37 published research papers in both the national and in international journals like Economic Journal stands testimony to his scholarship and a deep knowledge of these issues. His magnum opus is the book titled The Growth of Federal Finance in India, published by Oxford University Press in 1939. This book is considered as the basic text of federal finance in India by all, almost all the chairmen of several finance uh, commissions in India. They told me uh, personally this fact. Another book titled Mercantilism and East India Trade is a classic work published by P.S. King and Company in 1929. Here, Dr. Thomas presents convincingly both the theoretical and the practical aspects of mercantilist policy practiced in England. It is perhaps one of the most beautiful and authentic books on mercantilism. India's basic industries, Indian agricultural statistics, the farmer and his debts, etc. are some of the most important and very popular books penned by P.J. Thomas. And let us see or what are his main contributions in the area of development economics. His findings and op observations related to economics of development are unraveled in his papers, a plan for economic recovery, the central problem of Indian economy, India's economic malady, the problem of overpopulation, population and production, and the economic background. A plan for economic recovery published in 1935 astonishingly contains the seeds of or the, our most popular program, MGNREGA, then economic planning, then at the, at the same time, it also contains the seeds of the, the, the theories of vicious circle of poverty, the linkage effect, and various other important theories. And so uh, he started uh, the paper with this sentence. Perhaps the most disquieting feature of India's economic position today is the breakdown of the purchasing power, which has resulted from the heavy slump in the price of primary produce products since 1929. While the prices of manufactured goods have fallen only about 27% on an average, those of primary products fell more than 50%. And fixed charges like land revenue, rent, and interest payments remained constant as they were in 1929. All these factors resulted in a remarkable fall in the income India. Then another important uh, finding he made is the prevalence of the uh, trend known as vicious downward spiral. According to him, the after effects of this fall had created so many chain reactions in the economy, which he termed as vicious downward spiral. In his own words, when prices fall, incomes diminished. With the diminished income, the buying power has contracted and the business got slackened. Thus, the public fisc as well as the private purse came to be affected seriously. According to him, the upward spiral of economic recovery can be assured through undertaking public works seriously on a wide scale throughout the country. This was his strong belief. Then, um, the scheme of activity for upward spiral suggested by Thobas resembled all the important features of our present MGNREGA. Then, he argued that we must avoid contractors and middlemen in such, other, such type of activities. There must be direct control of state activities by, by the government. Moreover, an expert committee must be appointed in every province. Finance member 
must be the chairman of the committee. Again, local public works activities must be planned by local authorities. They must be scrutinized by this committee. Wage schedules and work conditions must be specified by this community, this committee. More than that, periodical survey of the economic results of these activities also must be done by competent persons. Then, regarding the selection of schemes, he suggested the following points. First of all, reference must be, or not reference, but preference must be given to works which require maximum human labor and a minimum capital investment. Secondly, emphasis must be given to a large number of small works scattered over a wide area of the country, not a few big schemes. Thirdly, focus must be given to distressed rural areas where purchasing power is very poor. Fourthly, minor works like wells, tanks, village roads and canals should be undertaken vigorously. It will put more money into the pockets of agricultural laborers and it will increase their consumption spending. Then you may be really astonished to, to hear all these words. Please remember these uh, these were ideas presented by Dr. Thomas India in 1935. But in the during the MGNRG, we are still practicing the very same, very same ideas and suggestions. Then again, he, he mentioned the importance of planning also. That is, according to him, each province must now plan and carry out a program of public works ranging over a period of five to ten years. The immediate expenditure must be largest but with improving economic conditions private agencies will revive and states outlay may be diminished and sometimes here we can find some sort of reflections of the linkage effect of the unbalanced effect theory proposed by Evo Hirschman. According to him if such programs if carried out properly, will improve the economic conditions in the economy and set in motion an upward spiral with generally rising prices, increasing employment and purchasing power, expanding trade and a rising public revenue. Thus, it will lead to economic recovery. This was his firm belief. Then, his another paper titled The Economic Side of Agriculture published in 1928, he explained very clearly how economics can be used uh, or, or economics can be of a very great service in the work of agriculture reform and the rural reconstruction in India. And then by quoting Alfred Marshall, he said, after all, the purpose of economics is the material welfare, welfare of human society. According to Marshall, economics is the study of man in the ordinary business of life. In Western Europe, Europe, the ordinary business of life of men are related to industrial and commercial activities. But in India, majority of people depend directly and indirectly on agriculture and a science that looks into the uh, propensity of man must give its prime care to the study of that predominant occupation. It was his firm belief. Then, again he argued that it is the duty of the Indian economist to give his attention wholeheartedly to the pressing problems of agriculture sector. Otherwise, he said, the uh, Indian economist is uh, unworthy of his profession falls to his dharma. It is his duty to study the economic ills of the community and to suggest suitable remedies. The economic side of agriculture was well considered by USA. Then according to him, in 1922, they made a separate Bureau of Agricultural Economics with a huge financial support from the government. And yet they produced substantial economic research which were very useful to the growth of 
uh, agriculture in that country. Then, then uh, uh, he made a very beautiful statement that our riots have to toil the whole day and a part of the night to keep his body and soul together. But what a great blessing it would be if research could lighten their burden and raise their standard of living. This was his opinion and a wish. And now we need more research on topics like supply and demand positions of crops, market conditions, crop specialization, and cost-effective methods of production. Certainly, it will help to raise our incomes and the standard of life of people. So, the role of economics and agricultural universities and agricultural research are uh, highlighted by Peter Thomas in this paper. And then, his um, very important contributions or we must say the monumental contributions are also all related to the age of public finance. As I mentioned earlier, his magnum opus is the book titled The Growth of Federal Finance in India. So, when he started thinking about his research on the topic federal finance in India, he wrote a letter to the famous historian, Dr. James Bryce, seeking his advice. Immediately, he gave his reply in his own handwriting and that letter is well kept in his home even today. And uh, Dr. the dream of Dr. P.J. Thomas was that of a federal setup of India. And he visualized uh, this concept and wrote this letter. And uh, James Bryce replied his letter uh, on the date of 1921, and the, letter, the, the key sentence of the letter uh, read like this, Dear Mr. Thomas, though I should call the Indian civilization a unity, for the differences between Northwest, Northeast, Far South, and the center seemed great than the whole. I traveled there in 1889. I agree with your view that if India were to be a self-governing whole, a federal system would be preferable to a unitary system. This was the advice given to Dr. P.J. Thomas by the famous uh, historian James Bryce. And Thomas accepted his, his uh, advice and continued his research and the final product was that his famous book, Growth of Federal Finance in India. Then, Thomas himself wrote in his book, The Growth of Federal Finance, these words. Mankind is in the throes of a great struggle. And if India is to play an honorable role in this struggle, she must pull herself together and rise above the clash of race, creed and colors. She must become a united federal commonwealth of which the numerous states as well as the 11 provinces will be integral parts. Is it too much to expect that this hope will soon be fulfilled? This is the sentence he wrote in that book. It all reveals his far-sightedness about the future shape of India. And this paper, an early proposal for a federal system of finance written in, in India in 27, also illustrates the historical evolution of a federal form of India. Regarding the central state financial relations and the flow of the financial resources between the center and the states, he strongly argued that the sound scheme of financial reconstruction must provide for elastic resources both for the central government and the provinces. He corroborates his argument in this direction, that is, sharing and allocation of different tax revenue between these two entities in the paper, the readjustment of the Indian financial system. 
In another paper, finance of Indian states, he presented a beautiful analysis of the revenue and expenditure in some of the leading states in India. Here, he compared the revenue and expenditure of Hyderabad, Mysore, Travancore, Jammu and Kashmir, Baroda, Indoor, Cochin, and Bikanir. In the paper titled RTC Scheme of Federal Finance, published in 1933, he established categorically that if a federal government is to function effectively in this country, it must have at its disposal elastic and dependable sources of revenue. Indeed, it is essential that income tax must be solely allotted to the federal government. This is a strong argument. Then it would be it would uh, it would be best to have a unified system of income tax, the proceeds of which may be shared by the federal government and the states in some equitable manner. He made this opinion with the three committees appointed by the round table conference, namely the Peel Subcommittee, the Fact Finding Committee under Lord Eustace Peel Percy, and Mr. J.C.C. Davidson recommended a scheme of federal finance which proposed the allotment of income tax to the provinces. This is a very important point. It also visualized a scheme of contributions by the provinces to the federal government. Thomas argued convincingly that the prime object of federation is to promote solidarity and the prosperity of India. And this end cannot be achieved by making the federal government dependent on provincial contributions even in the dire need. This was his firm belief. Then again, uh, in the paper, Indian finances um, in depression, he presented uh, high, most convincingly the how the Great Depression affected India and what are the important reasons. And uh, then he suggested the important ways uh, how we could so we could get out of uh, the, from the from the grips of Great Depression and. Uh, then he wrote, the Great Depression of 1930s was a, was a nightmare which the leading world countries hesitated to recollect. Such were the difficulties unleashed by the depression on the socio-economic life of the people elsewhere. During that period, India too had to share, had to suffer her share. The volume and the world and value of international trade declined and the revenues from all sources dried up. The position of the railways was the most disappointing factor according to Thomas. Hence, to get rid of the crisis, railway budget was separated in 1924. Please remember the railway budget was separated from the Union Budget India for the first time in the year 1924 and it was an instant success as shown by the improvement in the railway finances. Then, uh, again, uh, but in fact, to solve the financial crisis of 1931, the government adopted two bold steps. They are retrenchment and increased taxation. That is very important. The policies of a retrenchment and increased taxation. They, this may seem unbelievable today, but it was true. In the emergency budget of 1931, Sir George Schultz announced a cut of 10% in the pay of all government servants receiving more than 40 rupees per month. The Viceroy imposed upon himself a cut of 20% and the members of his council surrendered 15% of their salaries. The cut was a uh, to last till March 1933. The saving that resulted was only uh, 1.5 crores of rupees for the 16 months from 1931, uh, December 31 to March 1933. 
but it was necessary that government servants should make a service at a time of such serious national emergency. This was the opinion of Dr. P.J. Thomas. Then he continued, an increase of taxation was found necessary at an early stage. In the budget in 1931-32, the customs duties on liquids, sugar, battle nut, spices, and cinema films were uh, increased at varying rates. Changes were also made in the income tax rates. As a result, government expected an increase in the revenue equal to 9.82 crores of rupees from the uh, very uh, low levels uh, under this uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, an increase in the indirect taxation uh, by 5 crores of rupees. And along uh, with these, other import duties also has been changed. The new tax policies invited serious criticisms and protests on the people. They alleged that the finance member was balancing the government budget by unbalancing the budget of the business concerns. The finance member in uh, defending his, uh, his points uh, in the assembly, pointed out that the increased import duties would encourage Indian industry. Uh, this was not taken seriously by the critics, but later events showed that while import trade was hit by the heavy duties, internal, internal production did receive an in, unprotected fillip. Finally, the financial crisis passed away and although the heavy taxation discouraged businesses and unbalanced the budget of private individuals, the government's budget was closed with a comfortable surplus uh, in the year after, especially in 1932-33. The years when the most powerful nations in the world were struggling hard with the unbalanced budget. Then again, the article titled The Financial Prospect of the, Prospect of the New Constitution in 1936, he exposed the, the, his arguments uh, regarding the need for a strong federal government at the center with the, uh, immense economic resources at its hold. And this uh, uh, point which, uh, which we have discussed earlier in the previous paper as well. Then again, his contributions, um, then he argued that, another very, another very important the argument is that he also stood for uh, very uh, high levels of defense expenditure, uh, even, uh, even in the times of economic difficulties. And uh, he said that um, the, in defense, uh, he said that you must keep your armaments uh, on the scale adopted by your neighbors and the, and the possible enemies. Then in his own terms, uh, he says like this, India is like a man who in the insecure times of the world had to have a wall of hard, hard stone, although he lived in a mud house himself. If his means improved, his house would be better built, but he would not be wise in taking away the stone wall till his neighbors took off theirs in their defenses how to be strong until disarmament becomes a reality. This was his very strong argument regarding the need for defense expenditure. Then again, regarding the field of international economics also, he made very important contributions. And in his paper, England's Death to Indian Handicrafts, published in 1932, he presents quite convincingly how the virtual monopoly of India in the world's cotton industry was taken over by England. Then, unbelievable, but it is true. He wrote in his own words, I shall read, England is today the center of the world's cotton industry. Lanka share still continues to be the unrivaled center of cotton manufacture. Yet, this supremacy of England in cotton industry is hardly a century old. Before 1771, not even a yard of pure cotton cloth 
was made in England as English spinners could not make cotton strong enough to serve as war. This was uh, his, uh, his, his finding. And again, uh, in the paper titled The Trend of International Trade, published in 1933, he explains the reasons for the decline in the world's trade between 1929 and 1933. This is a very, very important paper. And in his, uh, in his opinion, during this period, the decline in trade was evident both in the quantity and the value of traded goods. The reason attributed for this decline in trade was related to the rising tide of economic nationalism. It manifested itself in the form of high tariff walls, exchange restrictions, import quotas, etc. This was the general belief. But Thomas went on further to explore the real reasons for this problem. This is, this is very, very important. He found that at the close of the 19th century, world economy was based on a not very equitable division of labor particular, uh, between uh, one part of the world which produced raw materials and the other part which, which, uh, which turned them into final goods. In another part of the paper, he didn't mince words to predict the adverse effects of this unequal distribution of the gains from trade which always went in favor of rich in, uh, industrialist countries. He observed that the industrial countries went on accumulating capital and continued to produce consumable goods of a fine quality. But the agricultural countries where dwell the bulk of the world's population have not the wherewithal to purchase them in spite of their moderate prices. The industrial countries did not realize the fact that their prosperity is dependent on the prosperity of the agricultural countries. And they went on perfecting the technology of production, leaving the consumption to an automatic adjustment. P. J. Thomas predicted accurately that this type of impoverishment of agriculture is, would affect negatively the selling powers of the industrialist countries. By the year 1929, he observed that uh, world prices slumped heavily, but the agricultural prices have slumped more heavily than non-agricultural prices. Moreover, he observed that agriculture has been the center law of world economy and it must do all the dirty jobs but get a paltry remuneration for the work of the surpluses and they flourished, at a, they flourished for a time by a... Um, sorry... Um, but they get a paltry remuneration for such work. Industry and trade obtained the bulk of the surpluses and they flourished for a time by an inequitable system of distribution. But this cannot go on forever. Thomas warned clearly. Then, it has brought about an economic collapse of unprecedented magnitude. The world cannot recover from this mess unless the relationship between Agriculture and industry is more equitably adjusted. Another very important proposal made by Thomas in this paper is that regarding the prospects of free trade and the need for regional cooperation among countries to reap the benefits from international trade, that is very important. To quote Thomas, Thoroughgoing free trade is for the time being a thing of the past. Its advantages still remain. But when the rest of the world pursues a policy of 
their strong economic nationalism, not even the powerful nation in the world can afford to maintain their purely free trade policy. Moreover, he opined that the countries interested must themselves enter into bilateral or multilateral agreements with a view to safeguard, uh, safeguarding their several interests. By mutual agreements, a gradual readjustment can be carried out spread over a series of years. They may agree on their respective lines of production and markets, and having agreed on these, tariffs between them may be lowered or even abolished if revenue considerations permit. Trade relations between, or trade, uh, between them may be placed on a well-adjusted quota system. Several such agreements may gradually create a planned world economy, however crude it may be. In the present circumstances, wisdom seems to be in such a line of action. See how correctly he predicted the need for regional cooperation uh, regarding trade uh, by almost all the trading countries, particularly the developing countries. Here we can find the seeds of customs, the theory of uh, customs duties explained by Jacob Weiner and others. And again, uh, here, please remember that these ideas and proposals um, were even though that is, even though he made clear these ideas and proposals years and um, years before the theory of customs union and the theory of a secular stagnation um, uh, in the terms of trade theories, uh, trade of uh, theories, we can find that his contributions, this um, Peter Thomas opinions, predictions, and the contributions remained monumental, and uh, we can understand very clearly before the theories of the Hector, uh, not. Uh, Alberto Hirschman's unbalanced theory, the Nerx's theory of vicious circle of poverty, and the Prabhupada Singer thesis of a secular stagnant in the terms of trade, uh, terms of trade, and the Jacob Weiner's theory of a customs union. We can find the preliminary or the crude forms of all these theories in the writings of Pierre Thomas in the year in the, during 1930s itself. But uh, in no textbooks or in no discussions, I never. Uh, um, heard of any mention about these kinds of contributions. All these are the important facts which uh, which promoted me or which which compelled me to continue my research work continuously for the period of 12 years. So after getting and reading one uh, and the, uh, the other papers, then I became highly highly encouraged to do more research. I think um, uh, the, you know, the listeners also may become convinced of my sincere opinions and. Then the paper titled The Economic Side of uh, uh, Agriculture. Then that I think he has lost connection. Let's wait. Must have fixed the exchange rate at a reasonable level and having fixed it, maintain at that level and do not uh, swerve from it except when compelled by dire circumstances. Again, he wrote nearly all the countries that devalued their currencies in recent years, that is in the 1930s, were compelled to do so, owing chiefly to persistent unfavorable balance of trade. They found it impossible to maintain their currencies except by diminishing their value. Thus, devaluation was forced by circumstances. It was not in most cases, a 
deliberate step to reap selfish advantage. The evaluation may give a relief in certain circumstances, but it must be accompanied by other measures of a constant or of a constructive character if any real good is to be resulted from it. According to him, in most countries where sorry, most countries which resorted to devaluation, it was accompanied by more far-reaching measures like extensive public works, readjustments of production, control of prices of various other and, uh, and various other, other controls. The recovery that resulted in Western countries after 1936 was largely uh, due to the colossal rearmament program. Then, in his own words, hence, to attribute recovery mainly to currency devaluation is absolutely unwarranted by facts. Thomas made his position clear in his paper Rupee Ratio, published in 1939. Then, uh, another important paper uh, published by P.J. Thomas is uh, um, India in World Depression. And this was published in 1935 the, in the International Journal called Economic Journal. This provides, this paper provides the reader a realistic picture of the impacts of Great Depression of 1930s on Indian economy. He starts the paper by saying that the first Great Depression of 1873-1896 did not seriously affect India because at that period, particularly before 1870s, India's connection with the rest of the world was not perfect. But by the year 1929, India became an integral part of the world economy as her primary products became essential for the feeding of men and machines in the West. And thus, she became a steady market for the finished goods of Europe, increase in the standard of living at home. Then, again, the beginnings of calico printing in England also uh, reflects more or less the the same ideas of the earlier paper known as the um, uh, England's dependence on India's uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, India's handicrafts. More of the same points are reflected in this in this paper also. And uh, these two papers, these two papers, in these two papers, um, he uh, he concluded these two papers with the same with the same, with the same statement made by Sidney Smith in 1945. Then the the quoting is this this. The great object for which the Anglo-Saxon race appears to have been created is the making of calico, which simply means how these uh, English people matured in the production of calico. That is why uh, this uh, person returned so. Then, in the field of money and banking, also um, Dr. Peter Thomas had made very very important contributions, and the central problem of banking. That a paper written in 1930, 1930 presents realistically uh, yeah, the analysis of uh, the Indian financial system. Then, and its major component, component agents, their activities, functioning, and the, the resultant variations in the interest rates. Uh, then, uh, all these discussions, are, the, the issues are discussed very clearly in that paper. Then, in his opinion, that is the, the paper, The Central Problem of India, in his opinion, uh, there is wide disparity between the bank rate and the market rates in India. And the smoothening of that disparity is the central problem of banking in India. Re please remember, he wrote this paper in 1930, that is before the establishment of Reserve Bank of India. Till then, the Imperial Bank was performing the functions of the Central Bank of India. Hence, he wrote, we have to remember in this connection that the Imperial Bank is not a proper Central Bank, 
but only an ordinary commercial bank doing banking business for the state that although it tries to control credit by manipulating the bank rate, such a control is ineffective as it, is, as it has no control over currency and it has even uh, and as even the indigenous bankers are not always bound to take the cue from it. Here, here in lies the root cause of the disparity between the bank rate and the market rate. There is only one remedy to this and that is the establishment of a central bank which will be the coping stone of the financial edifice of the country. Such a reserve bank must be entrusted with the regulation of the currency as well as the credit and you must hold the reserves of the bankers and the government. Only such a bank will be able to effectively control the interest rates and handle the credit situation. So later years witnessed the establishment of Reserve Bank of India and how the optimistic predictions of Thomas became reality is a part of modern India's history. Then perhaps um, you may be wondering, he, may, he made another very important study in um, Tamil Nadu on the banking habits of Nata Kota Chetias. Uh, and in uh, that paper, he explained very clearly very clearly what are the features of the, the, the banking system of Natakota Chetias and how uh, what, what are their unique features and how they excelled in their banking business at all. And a beautiful ex explanation was there, uh, has been given in that paper. And I'm not going to I'm not going to elaborate more about because it is very important but the same because due to the lack of time because uh, the chairperson Devi has told me that um, I must limit uh, the, all the presentation within, uh, within the given allotted span of time. So the, the main point is this, the, that paper was is one of the very famous papers written by uh, P.J. Thomas on indigenous banking. And um, if time permits, uh, I shall give more explanations about it. And more than that, this paper and the, all the important papers which I have presented in this discussion are included in, in, my, in my new book, which, which was released the day before yesterday. The title of the book is The Collected Scientific Papers of Pioneer Economist and Planner, Dr. P.J. Thomas. And uh, this title was suggested to me by none other than the, 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 the giant economic historian in India. By, uh, understand the back chief, as I already told you earlier. And then, then he also made very important contributions in the local development issues as well. And here, there's a work called Some South Indian Villages. And I, I have re-survey. And all my listeners also can take a serious cue from this paper. And this paper elaborates and convince and convincingly explains how important is the, the, the need for continuous observation and can or continuous monitoring of the regional development trends in all the villages and towns. So we know um, uh, history is the best teacher. And we know uh, when when as common people, uh, we know how different are our, our villages 50 years back and now. What were the socio, cultural and economic changes which did take place in our villages all over India during, uh, during the last 50 years and now. But in order to get a clear picture or a step-by-step -step analysis uh, of this uh, transition or evolution is possible if and only if and only if we continuously, there, there, is, a, there is an agency to evaluate continuously year by year or or, 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 or during the uh, gaps of uh, five years or ten years to understand and evaluate the changes which took place. It may be due to education development or, or, or it may be due to industrial development or it may be due to uh, changes in the banking structure or, or there may be so many changes may be there but we must be able to record all these changes and we must be able to point out the important reasons for these changes. 
and how these revolutionary changes are taking place in our economy. And again, in the period of a decentralized planning, we are writing local development history. Of course, it is true, but I seriously doubt whether we are taking seriously the writing of a lo the uh, uh, local development history, which we started during the ninth plan period. This is very important. But if the, the writing of the local development history has been continue had, had been continued from 1999 onwards till now continuously, I, I am I am afraid whether all the panchayats did that very well. And if it had been done continuously, uh, uh, we, we could expose before the world the systematic analysis of the, the transition process or the development transition process of, the, of our country, particularly Kerala's development, decentralized development experience and planning experience. And so the, the best, one of the best uh, experiments or one of the um, best lessons of uh, this resurvey of villages has been provided by this one. And you as, as you know, the first resurvey of Indian villages was made by Professor Slater. And after 20 years, this task was taken up by this Dr. P.J. Thomas. And then um, there's a Slater conducted study in a 12 villages, but uh, uh, and this study has been undertaken by Department of Economics, University of Madras. And then Dr. Thomas conducted, so the first study was done, by, done in 1916-17 and um, by Dr. Slater, but in 1930, Thomas took up the study in 1936-37. And then the first study included 12 villages and in the uh, second study by Thomas, he included only eight, uh, nine villages. They were, Vadam, the villages are Vadamalai Puram, Gangai Kondan, Pala Korachi, Yerimeli Pert, Dosi, uh, Unagatala, Vadakancheri, Guru Mayur, and Kodachar. These were the nine panchay or, or villages uh, he studied elaborately. And I shall tell you very briefly. The most important, most important findings of his of his research, both positive and negative, and then uh, the the negative points are one: the area under cultivation has not increased with the increase in population, even though there were there are vast areas of uh, uncultivated land, but uh, culti the actual cultivation did not the area of cultivation did not, did not increase, so, did not increase. Secondly. Very strong prevalence of absentee landlordism in all the villages. Thirdly, increased rural debt burdens were highly prevalent in, in, in all the villages. And then all these villages were uh, less self-sufficient in the production of food, st food uh, stuffs. This is also very important. These are the most important negative findings which you could observe from the resurvey. And then the positive findings are one, all the villages are better linked through uh, uh, with the help of railways and the trunk roads. Even the feeder roads have improved. The motor bus has broken the isolation between the town and country. Second, there is a greater appreciation of the value of literacy even by the backward communities, sorry, backward communities, resulting in a positive spread of education. More uh, than uh, more are able to read vernacular literature and the lighter, lighter journals. Again, the prejudice against modern agricultural improvements were disappearing. And again, again the beginnings of local self-governments were, were uh, getting encouraged. And then the government and the leaders of the people have, in the last 20 years, shown greater interest in schemes of rural relief and rural welfare. He concluded by stating that such periodical surveys of the same villages will give us definite indications of the trends of progress in the country and will supply valuable data for the economist and the historian. This is very important, as I have, I have mentioned earlier. Then another very important work, which made very popular uh, P.J. Thomas in, in India is the, is the paper titled, uh, not the paper, it is a study report called Economic Results of Prohibition in Salem District. 
that's a very famous paper, very famous work then uh, a total prohibition was tried in the whole district of british india that is salem for the first Dr. thomas sorry to interrupt you dr thomas yes, but pardon. there is a question uh, somebody has asked a question and well, we are running really short of time so if okay. you can answer yes, then you answer that question also Definitely. Sorry for this interruption. Uh, may, may, may I conclude my presentation first, then I, then I can... Please do, please do, because, uh, I mean... Okay, uh, this is the okay. This is my turn. Um, then, uh, I, I, shall, I shall read the, the important findings of his, his uh, the, the, the paper, especially this uh, um, uh, prohibition, the effects of prohibition. One. Except in border villages and among few urban laborers, liquor consumption was completely uh, stopped during the period under study. Secondly, there were at first unfavorable psychological and uh, physiological reactions, but except among the hard drinkers, uh, uh, this problem was minimum. Then, the efficiency of the uh, labor seems to have increased among the mill workers in Salem town. Then, the spending power formerly used for drink has been devoted largely for a more varied and adequate diet, now better clothes and more amusements. The expenditure on tea, coffee, vegetables, uh, curds, ghee, oils and meat increased. Then another very important finding is the social and moral effects of prohibition were remarkable. In particular, the position of women and children uh, among the working classes. These are the most important findings of a study. Mom, Mom, just, I'm just concluding my presentation and now I am, I am ready to, um, as far as possible, uh, to, go, to give answers and clarify all the doubts from the uh, res respected uh, listeners. Mom, please. There we go, Mom. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas. Uh, the question is an interesting one. You will find it in the chat, chat box, but I'll read it up, read it out for you. It's by Ashokar Chandran. Uh, he's asking this question. In your research, did you come across any article, speech, or book by P.J. Thomas on Kerala economy or Madras economy? as he was economic advisor to the premier of the Madras province. Yes, um, but I'm, almost all these papers, are, the, all, almost all the published papers which, which I could collect were based on Indian economy, mostly, most of them. And uh, um, based on Kerala economy specifically, I, uh, I couldn't find a specifically any detailed analysis. Almost all the all the papers are on the on the micro based on the basis of Indian economy. The, which the, the, these are the papers on the, on the 37 papers which I could collect belong to this category. Unfortunately, it, it may uh, because I mean my inability, I, I, I didn't get. I couldn't uh, meet with any uh, yeah, serious paper completely concentrated upon the contributions of uh, sorry, the development of Kerala economy. Yes, Dr. Sunil, uh, Dr. Sulmani wants to ask a question. Yes, Sunil, um, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Thomas, for this very elaborate and comprehensive presentation on this uh, giant of uh, an economist. Because I was just looking, um, this man has worked in University of Madras only for 15 years, but his uh, uh, amount of publications, both national and international, have, uh, on a wide range of topics ranging from development economics in general to international trade, uh, you know, to uh, to public finance and then to village studies is uh, quite phenomenal. And he has uh, two papers as far as I can see from what you have written in the economic journal itself during that time. And I'm sure it would have been extremely difficult for someone from India to get uh, an article published in a very prestigious journal of the Royal Economic Society. Uh, especially during the pre-independence period. Okay, now the question that I would like to ask is: um, you, you see, the many of the ideas that you have had, uh, you know, on development, you know, for instance, on regional trading agreements, etc. These are, uh, you know, uh, precursors to many of the later on ideas that we have been using. But you know, the uh, uh, 
for quite some time during your lecture, Professor Francis Stewart from University of Oxford was also present here, but he has now left. Uh, and um, you know, and and she would have actually added that uh, Asian drama, which was one of the most important development economics first development economics uh, uh, book that we written in nineteen sixty eight. Okay. Uh, when you look into the major ideas in that book, you know, none of the Indian economists who said anything about any any of those issues were cited. Okay. And in fact, uh, Peter Thomas would have been one of the potential uh, authors, which uh, Guna Vidal should have cited for quite a lot of his ideas uh, in, in that book. So I just thought that, uh, you know, that's an interesting aspect that could be looked at, looked at you know, how uh, Western authors, and in fact, I would say even Indian authors don't uh, uh, cite, for instance, I have not seen uh, any Indian authors. I mean, of course, uh, I'm not that well read in some of the economic history areas, but none of the Indian authors have ever brought out the fact that uh, uh, MG NREGA type of uh, employment program was first propounded by uh, H. Thomas. And even those who do village studies, you know, excepting for, uh, you know, people like Professor Raj, et cetera, and so on, who mentioned H. Uh, uh, Thomas, even village studies where you have to do continuous studies, as you said, longitudinal studies of how things are improving. You know, later on, we have a very recent work by uh, uh, Nicholas Stern and others in, in this village called Palanpur. Okay. And, uh, and even in CDS, some colleagues are actually looking at, uh, uh, especially for internal, uh, international migration, you know, how that has helped specific villages over a long period of time. You know, so this village studies, the foundation for this uh, has been uh, given by, and, and to Ashok Chandran's uh, question, I think some of the villages that you mentioned uh, are from Kerala, Gurubayur, for instance. And uh, so maybe uh, I think those are the closer contacts which P.J. Thomas had with uh, the Kerala economy, you know, so because you are looking at uh, Madras presidency rather. Yeah, well, that, was, that, was, that was the reason, sir, because we were right at that period of time was part of Madras presidency, right? yes, of course. Yeah. Well, please. Uh... Yeah. Yes, uh, pardon, pardon me, sir. Uh, let me tell you uh, the, the first uh, first question. That. So I could gather only one to one specific uh, article on Kerala. The title was Kerala. That is Kerala culture. It's a distinctive features. That is the only the only article which I, which I could gather which he wrote uh, on Kerala alone. That is uh, no other because you know almost all the articles. Uh, or the leading articles, we can find some types of, types of references, that is all. In, especially in case of uh, peasant proprietor. For example, uh, when he when he discussed the problem of peasant proprietorship, uh, land reforms, etc., he mentioned about how uh, uh, agriculture in Kerala is, is different from other parts, then how land systems in Kerala is different from other parts, how the land tenure systems in Kerala is different from other parts, and so such articles, such points are, are, are represented in other articles also. And that, pardon me, sir. Continue, sir. Vargi, sir. Actually, I would like to add here. I mean, Vargi has a question waiting. But okay, before, yeah. I would like to add that I have, uh, um, you know, followed his work in Malayalam through okay. the 1930s and 40s. He has actually written extensively on Kerala. Very interesting work on Kerala on migration, uh, for example, from uh, internal migration in Kerala from Pala to the uh, high range areas, for example, uh, on the impact on the economy of Pala. Um, but both more importantly, on migration to far flung areas like Brazil, you know, he had a series of articles in the Naswani Dibiga, which was, of course, a prominent paper of that time in which he proposed that um, uh, um, a solution to uh, the so-called population problem uh, in uh, the Travancore Cochin areas might be not uh, family planning or contraception, but actually the migration of farmer households uh, to Brazil. And in fact, a few families from Kerala did go to Brazil um, on, you know, through the Catholic Church's good offices. Um, and of course, the, and I think most striking also was his proposal for a coastal state, because his his um, he was not really in favor of linguistic uh, language as a criteria for state formation, and he was 
far more uh, you know uh, interested in environmental and and resource uh, considerations uh, yeah, i mean i'm just adding that uh, anyway varghese has a question varghese can you please yeah. ask yeah i'm audible yes you are yes, 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 uh, thank you Dr. Okay, thank you thank you thank you so much thank then you dr thomas for uh, giving us a sense about the intellectual uh, enterprise of dr pj thomas you know ranging from finance yes, to village studies um, what is also perhaps fascinating about dr pj thomas is uh, also his versatility as devika was indicating he has written quite a bit in malayalam as well he was along with this uh, economic writings he was writing about the history of saint thomas he was writing about saint thomas himself uh, he was writing about the marriage customs of uh, syrian christians uh, also this magnum opus malayala sahityam christianism all this uh, you know, was uh, you no know, part of the world of ideas that he was uh, grappling with uh now my question is something uh, you know different uh, devika has also already indicated that he has written quite a lot about uh, you know kerala and its specific uh, developmental issues particularly uh, in malayalam after 1950s uh, and of course in this thought there is a reiteration of the federal principle uh, in his you know economic thought as you have rightly pointed out in the beginning but i also felt that there was a tinge of uh, internationalism uh, and global in his thought while seeking solutions to national problems uh, this is perhaps you know that went against the general grain of the time um, as it uh, attempted to transcend the powerful national you know in some ways for instance as uh, again devika has pointed out he advocated migration and land reclamation across national borders as a solution to the development crisis uh, and food scarcity that india was facing at that point in time i remember towards the end of 1950s he has written an article in uh, deepika about uh, the possibilities of migrating to brazil and after a couple of weeks he has to write again being stunned by the response you know of people who are very eager to migrate to 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 brazil so it sounded very utopian in 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 uh, you know in some ways but i felt that uh, dr thomas kept alive that utopian thought you know as it had some place in his thoughts of the possible right so my question is have you come across this strong strand of internationalism and globalism uh, in his economic writing and uh, perhaps vision for development yeah thank you yeah, yeah sir may i clarify my position sir both for for devika mama mama and vargis i shall clarify my position first regarding the devika mama uh, regarding the population what is his main uh, principle was that india in his own words india's greatest wealth today is her population our duty is not to control birth but to improve the health and the productive efficiency of our people uh, he he wrote this in the, in the in the paper the problem of overpopulation published in 1941 then another clarification that i would like to give uh, to both of you is that i did really concentrate for this work for this work uh, only on his published series of published research papers in uh, in a, in a very famous research journals and uh, i did so uh, the this uh, in order to study very clearly and to to observe the real contribution of an economist my conviction is that uh, we must go through his uh, very serious published research articles and that is why i concentrated for this work only on the his articles published in the economic journal in an okay, international historical review labor uh, international then then the labor journal and uh, the economic journal and all these famous journals and the books also it is published in uh, books especially in the only in english uh, especially in um, the books as well as journals but uh, the points which you mentioned uh, they are very familiar to me and the in the first book which i wrote about pj thomas it was in malayalam and the title of that book is um, dr pj thomas the kings of kerala the title is 
it is, it is the, the, the Priya Thomas Kerala's Keynes. That is the title. It was published in 1940, published by SPC Scotty, Sahitya Pravartaka Sahitya Samagotay. And within one year itself, three uh, editions were published and uh, it enabled me to buy two academic, sorry, not academic, matter literary journals. And in that book, I have mentioned about all the important points um, Professor Vargisa has mentioned. And uh, uh, so, my, then after writing that book, uh, I turned my attention from presenting, we uh, can say, a, a multifaceted genius rather than a multifaceted genius uh, to a serious economist. My aim was to present Dr. Vijay Thomas as one of the greatest economists which India had presented. That was my effort. And uh, for that uh, uh, for that purpose, I continued my research up to 1914 also continuously. And uh, so I did not refer to, and I did not quote any article published by him, either Malayala Manorama or Madhupumi or Deviga or Pasha Boshni. I know all these articles. I am familiar with these, these articles also. But when I published a serious work, a scientific work like this, so I, the, the title of the, the present, the, the, the uh, title of the work is um, the Collected Scientific Papers of Pioneer, Pioneering Economist and Planner. So in that book, I must present these types of very serious articles. Pardon me, this is the this is my effort. And in the, the, the last book which I published two years ago, the, the story of Pilia Thomas, an Anderson economist. It is very well clear, very clear that my aim was to find to establish Dr. Pilia Thomas as a very known and a very famous economist, having very strong convictions and uh, from the opinions and uh, reviews from the different economies and the different publications and people, then I was fully satisfied. Then everybody accepted that book and they are they always encouraging me. So through that book, I could place Dr. Pedro Thomas, the most famous economist, which Kerala had given birth to. That is a very important point. And then and the, and the, I shall tell you another fantastic thing. When I published, uh, the, uh, during the release function of uh, this, um, my first book, Carol in the Case, some Malayalam professors were, were, there, were there. And then after hearing my speech and reading the book, they um, came, they start debating uh, with me. Who told me that uh, they say Vijay uh, Thomas was, was an economist? She was a, a literary genius of which Malayalam uh, Kerala has ever produced. Then they, they uh, began to uh, narrate before me one, one all, almost all the important books and uh, the articles published by him. And you know, he had even um, written a poem also. It, he has written one Malayalam poem, and that poetry is also with me. And it is one of Giri Prabhashanam. And then, so that the, all, almost all his contributions, both in my, almost all his contributions are with me because it is a, it is a continuous research spanning over a period of 12 years. And so because of this, this spirit gets to work. And uh, I, I think when I could present, uh, as I told you, the day before yesterday, in the book release, the book release function, the book was released by Dr. C. Rangarajan, an eminent economist. And uh, Dr. Amigomar Bakshi was there. Dr. K. L. Krishna was there, Dr. Uh, M. Govindara was there, uh, and Dr. Professor, our professor Uman, Uman also was there. So, when, if I, if I, uh, I could uh, assemble all these great economists in the same meeting only because of the fact that all these people strongly believe that Vijay Thomas was one of the greatest economists India had ever produced. And instead, if I um, concentrated on, not concentrated, instead I, I, I used to um, uh, write books on part one, uh, this literature, literary contribution, part, like part two, political contribution, third one, then it, I, I, would not, I would not have been able to, to, to give uh, such, a, uh, such a bright figure for Dr. P. J. Thomas. And ultimately, Dr. P. J. Thomas was, was a born economist, no doubt. He was a born economist. Because uh, uh, Professor Amigomar Bakshi, he told me vigorously, uh, why, then he, uh, he appreciated my work and encouraged me, and uh, then he is really wondering how I could collect all these papers. And uh, Dr. Dangarajan and my family were also the same opinion. And uh, these are the very gratifying moments for me.
Thank you. This is my personal experience. I am, I am, I am telling you from the from the bottom of my heart. Uh, any other question, ma'am? Hello, Devi, ma'am. Any other question? Any other uh, doubts which I, I need? Think, uh, I think most of the questions are done. I want to thank you um, again uh, uh, for this, uh, you know, very informative talk. Um, and uh, and I think the discussion has been very fruitful also. We look forward to reading more of your work in the future. And um, I'm uh, so that um, I think we shall we have come to an end to the end of this program. I'm very grateful to all of you who have attended this uh, uh, lecture. I hope you have benefited uh, from uh, Dr. Thomas's um, knowledge and 12 years of uh, intense research. Uh, thank you very much. Thank I'm you. closing the session. Okay, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye then. Goodbye.